Hey, Mission Hills, good to be with you again this Sunday. If you are a guest with us joining our online services, I want to greet you warmly on behalf of our church family. My name is Pastor Jamin. It's good to be with you as you join us from your home or wherever you're viewing this. A couple things I want to put in front of you and remind you are happening in the life of the church as we get started here. One is uh, just a reminder about how we're doing our online services now. You'll notice at the church website, missionhillschurch.org, that you can view our, our services each Sunday in two ways. You can view them on demand or in a, as a live service. Now, the on demand means that at any time you can click the link there and you can view these services at any point on Sunday or even later in the week if you'd like to. The live service is specifically designed to create space where you can share prayer requests, uh, ask questions, chat and interact with others from the church through an online format that we have. And so that service time will be provided at 10 a.m. every Sunday. And so if you're looking to to connect a little bit, uh, maybe again share a prayer request, um, interact with others, that's the space to do it. Uh, A few folks from our staff every Sunday will be uh, hosting that online service and available there to answer questions and interact as well. Um, The online service at 10 a.m. will be followed every Sunday by a a time for folks to continue to connect through a Zoom chat that uh, Pastor Mike has been hosting and uh, our other pastoral staff and and church staff will be hosting in the weeks ahead. And also it's followed by a, a student's kind of hangout time on Zoom as well with with Adam Hankerson, our student ministries director. So if you're looking to connect connect a bit on Sundays, you can do so through the live service at 10 a.m. and then immediately following another kind of adult uh, connection time through a Zoom meeting or a student connection time immediately following through a Zoom meeting. With that, just one other reminder about something else that is coming up in the coming weeks, a class I'll be teaching on uh, Christian spiritual classics. This is a class I've done now for several summers. This will be the third summer offering it. I'll be hosting the class at this time uh, as scheduled through a Zoom meeting online. Uh, If that changes in the coming months as we move forward in the summer and we're able to meet together in person, we'll make adjustments accordingly. But right now it's scheduled to be a a Zoom meeting each month throughout the summer. What we'll be doing is reading through a couple spiritual classics. We'll be reading C.S. Lewis's The Weight of Glory and John Cassian's Conferences and spending time each month reading those and then meeting up once a month to discuss and dialogue. I'll do a little bit of teaching, but also create space for us to kind of share what these texts have kind of brought up for us. So really encourage you to sign up. If you're interested, you can email Lori Hopkins at lhopkins at missionhillschurch.org. Well, with that... As we continue in our service this morning, prepare our hearts to sing praise to the Lord and lift our voices in our homes to worship Him. I want to begin with our call to worship in Psalm 68. For those of you that are joining us as guests, we, we begin our time of singing praise and worshiping God by reading a psalm. The, the psalms are the worship book of the Bible, so it's a good place for us to start. And we'll be in Psalm 68 if you're following along there in your own Bibles, verses 1 through 10. God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so you shall drive them away. As wax melts before a fire, so the wicked shall perish before God. But the righteous shall be glad. They shall exalt before God. They shall be jubilant with joy. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides the deserts. His name is the Lord, exalt before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in a parched land. O God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. Rain in abundance, O God, you shed abroad. You restored your inheritance as it languished. Your flock found a dwelling in it. In your goodness, O God, you provided for the needy. Would you pray with me? As we turn our hearts in prayer, I just want to invite you for just a moment to take some space in silence as best you can in your home and just share your heart with the Lord for a few moments. Share with him the things you're worried about, the things you desire, Share with them perhaps areas of sin you need to confess or acknowledge. 
share with them anxieties you might be holding or hopes you might have, questions you might have. What's Just what's on your heart. Just take a moment to share that with the Lord. Well, Father, we find ourselves living in strange times, and we find comfort in the words of this psalm in light of that. In your goodness, O God, you provided for the needy. Lord, there are many in our world who are in desperate need right now, many around the world who've been impacted by COVID and its fallout, what it has meant both for people's health and well-being and safety, but economic stability their access to food and resources. We acknowledge, Lord, the world over that there are many who are in desperate need, in need of safety and protection, need of care, need of food. And so, Lord, we cry out to you on their behalf. We ask, Lord, that you would move in mercy and goodness and provision in these places and that you would use your church, Lord, as an instrument of your goodness and your mercy around the world to demonstrate the good news of the gospel by acts of service and care. Father, I'm I'm mindful that there are many in our own community immediately here, as well as connected to our church family who are also needy. And we ask that you would provide, that you would move in mercy and care for those who are in need. Father, I'm mindful that there are some in our church family who live on their own. And the words of this psalm perhaps bring them comfort in this time. That you settle the solitary in a home. It can be difficult to be sheltered in our homes, Lord, when we find ourselves alone, unable to go out and connect with friends or family or gather together with our church family week in and week out. May you remind those who are solitary in this time in their homes that they are not alone, that the home they find themselves in is, in fact, not ultimately their home, that their lives are hidden in Christ with you, that you have welcomed them into your household, that they find themselves in your presence, the presence of a loving, caring Father who is watching over them, who is with them, who is their steady and sturdy, loving companion. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Perfect 
spotless righteousness The great unchangeable I am The King of glory and of grace One with himself I cannot die My soul is purchased by his blood My life is hid with Christ on high my Savior and my God Because a sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the just is satisfied To look on Him and pardon me To look on Him and pardon me
I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless to stand before the throne Good morning, church family. My name is Ashley Lalkin, and I am the Family Ministries Director here at Mission Hills Church. My name is Sarah, and I am a Family Ministries Intern. Children's Ministry is so excited to be joining the Sunday Sermon with a video especially for you children. Today's video is about Israel's first king, but we're going to do a memory verse together from Jeremiah 10.6. So you guys can get your Bibles and flip to Jeremiah 10.6. We'll wait for you guys to get there give you guys a little bit of time. We kind of cheated. We had our bookmark in it. All right. There There is none none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. All right. And this is the video, Israel's First King. Hey there. It's me, Megan. And I'm Jessie. Megan, guess what we have in our neighborhood? What? A fox! Sam and I are lurking on a fox trap. We want to trap the fox and keep it as a pet. Oh, well, I don't think that's a good idea, Jessie. How come? Well, foxes aren't meant to be pets. They can be dangerous. A fox could hurt your dogs, Max and Sadie. Oh, no. I better tell Sam we have to stop the plan. (laughs) Good idea, Jessie. And today's Bible story, God's people wanted something that was not good for them. A fox? No, not a fox. A king. They wanted a king to rule over them like the other nations around them. God's people already had a king. God. Listen to this story to find out what happened when the Israelites got a king. Samuel was a judge in Israel. One day, God's people said, the people around us have a king. We want a king too. Samuel was not sure what to do, so he prayed. God said, give the people a king, but warn them what an earthly king can do. A king could make their sons serve in the army. A king could make their daughters work for him, or he could take away their land and servants. Still, the Israelites didn't care. Give us a king, they said. God chose a man named Saul to be king. Samuel anointed Saul with oil, and the Spirit of God was with Saul. When the time came for the Israelites to meet their new king, Saul was missing. The people found Saul hiding. Saul stood among all the people, and they said, Long live the king! But Saul was not a good king. He did not obey God. One day, Saul took an army to fight the Philistines. But the Philistines had more chariots, more horses, and more soldiers. Saul wanted to ask God for help. Maybe if he made an offering to God, they would win the battle. But that was not a good idea. Only the priests were allowed to give offerings to God. Saul waited for Samuel to come, but Saul's soldiers started to leave. Saul decided to make an offering to God himself. Then Samuel arrived. What have you done? Samuel asked. You have disobeyed God. You will not be king much longer. Sometime later, the Israelites won a battle against the Amalekites. God told Saul to destroy everything, but Saul did not obey. He only destroyed things he didn't want. God told Samuel, I am sorry that I made Saul king because he does not obey me. Saul argued with Samuel. I did obey God, he said. I just saved the best animals to sacrifice to the Lord. Does God care more about obedience or sacrifices? Samuel asked. You rejected his instruction, so God has rejected you as king. Saul admitted his sin and asked for forgiveness. Samuel said, 
God is going to make someone else king. Wow, God's people wanted a king, even though they already had one, God. So Saul became king, but he wasn't a very good king because he was not obedient to God. So Samuel told Saul that God was going to bring a new king. And we're going to continue this story next week to see what happens in this king that's going to come. Family Ministries wanted to share two exciting things with you, church family. One, we are doing at-home summer midweek kits. They'll be coming alongside the curriculum that we are doing for you guys this summer. And if you register at missionhillschurch.org, we will custom make at-home kits for students and children. Inside, there'll be great activities, crafts, and fun things to do this summer with your children as you draw close to God. And also, if you've been following along on Instagram, Sarah and I have been reading the Jesus Storybook Bible with you guys every day. It's been such a joy to see all of God's story. And yesterday was our last story. So join us later today on Instagram for a celebration as we celebrate reading Jesus Storybook Bible together. We can't wait to see you guys there. And it's been such a joy to be here with you today. Bye. Good morning, church family. My name is Don Duffy. Uh, If you have your Bibles handy, uh, turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 8, and we'll be reading verses 6 through 12. Uh, I'll be reading the uh, English Standard Version. That's Revelation, chapter 8, verses 6 through 12. Starting in verse 6. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet. And something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining. Likewise, a third of the night. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning and welcome to Mission Hills Church Online. Glad that you could be joining us. If you're a guest with us, my name is Sam Paschal, one of the pastors here. And we're continuing our series through the book of Revelation. Revelation part four is what we're in. And we're going to be jumping into Revelation chapter eight and going to be looking at the first four trumpets today. But as we begin, I want to ask you a question that I've been pondering and considering this past week. What if Revelation didn't predict the end of the world? This question has troubled me all week. Disorienting would be the right word. I've lived the better part of my life with the understanding that this book was a sort of roadmap to the end times. And even if I didn't fully understand it, it provided me with the clues that I needed to discern if the end times were upon us. There's this sort of strange comfort that comes from knowing that the Bible has already predicted what's going to happen. And if I unlocked Revelation's code, then I wouldn't be caught off guard by the strange and troubling events that would portend the end of the world. The system I was raised within gave me the answers about the future, and those answers gave me a kind of security, a sense that the Bible had mapped out the way that the world was going to end so I could be prepared. But what if those aren't the answers that the Bible gives? 
What if the last book of the Bible wasn't about the end of the world, but about its new beginning? What if Revelation was a new genesis? What if Revelation isn't providing a roadmap that I thought it was? What if for my whole life I had the map upside down? Disorienting would be the right word. Now all of a sudden I don't know where I stand or which direction to go. What was north is now south. What was east is now west. The initial feeling of disorientation, though, would ultimately give way to a new feeling, a new kind of experience, relief. If I turned the map upside down, suddenly things that didn't make sense because the map was upside down would be clarified. Ways that I was lost, stuck, or confused would be avoided because now I could actually see where I was going, which direction I needed to head in. What if Revelation wasn't describing events still future to us, but events long since past? What might that mean about not only how we read Revelation, but how we understand our place in the world and what it is that God might be doing? If I haven't been given a roadmap to the end of the world, what is the map that God has given? And in which direction is it pointing us? Well, this morning might raise your eyebrows, might even cause you to be somewhat disoriented. Some of you may leave today and still disagree with me, still think that Revelation is describing events leading up to the end of the world. And that's all well and good. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ, and we can disagree in love. But my hope this morning is not to confuse or disorient you, but rather to reorient you. And to hopefully leave you with a sense of relief and joy that has come from turning the map right side up. From reading Revelation not as a book that's primarily about the end of the world, but about its new beginning. So let's take a look together today at what this map looks like when we turn it the other way. Today we're just going to look at the first four trumpets of what are called the trumpet judgments. They are in the middle set of a sequence of three sevens of divine judgments, three sets of seven divine judgments, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. This morning, we're going to look at the first four of the seven trumpets. But before we look at these trumpet judgments, we need to understand three important details that John is using, the trumpets, the plagues, and the land. Trumpets, especially seven trumpets, point us back to a well-known story in the Bible, the destruction of the city of Jericho in the book of Joshua. God commanded Israel to march around Jericho once a day for six days, and then on the seventh day to march around the city seven times, and seven priests would blow seven trumpets. The blowing of the trumpets would cause the walls of the city to fall down flat, as the text says. So when we hear of seven trumpets, we should begin to expect a city like Jericho to be destroyed. Trumpets also announce a series of seven plagues, plagues that point us back to perhaps one of the most famous stories in the Bible, the story of the ten plagues that God sent to judge Egypt and free his people Israel. This series of seven plagues echoes a number of the plagues which struck Egypt. Hail, water turning to blood and poison, darkness, locusts. When we hear of Exodus-like plagues, we should begin to expect a nation being judged for its hard-heartedness and idolatry and a new kind of Exodus beginning to occur, God's people escaping from the clutches of an oppressive and wicked nation. Lastly, we need, to pay, we need to pay close attention to location. As real estate agents often say, location, location, location. Location is everything in the text. And Revelation was originally written in a language called Koine Greek or Common Greek. And the word that frequently shows up here not in text 7, but in verse 7 of the text, but also throughout the book of Revelation that's translated earth, could also be translated as land. Earth has a connotation of something global across the face of the whole earth, while land, the word land, has a much more local connotation. 
In fact, the word land in the Old Testament is the third most common word in the entire Old Testament. It is used frequently and almost always refers to the land of Israel, what we now call the promised land. When we read the word earth, it's best to think of it as land, specifically the land of Israel. These seven trumpet plagues are focused on one particular place, the land of Israel, not the whole earth. With these three details in place now, let's go take a look at these first four trumpets. The first trumpet sounds here, and hail and fire and blood fall from the sky, burning up, as John says, a third of the earth, a third of the trees, and all green grass. This plague, like the plague of hail that struck Egypt, destroys primary sources of food. The earth, which produce crops, the trees, which produce fruit, the grass, which produces grain. The implication of this plague is that famine is coming. Jesus himself would predict this event. Standing on a hill opposite the mountain on which the temple of, of the Jews was situated, he looks across the valley out at the temple and he tells his disciples, truly I say to you, there will not be one stone of the temple left on another that will not be thrown down. The disciples, curious about when this foreboding prediction would happen, ask Jesus, tell us when these things will be. And Jesus goes on to give them a series of signs to look for, one of which is famines. Famines, he says, are, quote, but the beginning of the birth pains. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that before the temple is to be destroyed, we should expect famines to strike the land, increasing in frequency and severity, just as birth pains do. In the book of Acts, Chapter 11, we have recounted for us one such famine that began to plague the land of Israel. Later in the New Testament, as we read Paul's letters, we get the hints and the clues that he is traveling across the Mediterranean world, raising funds so he can buy crops for for people who are famine-stricken in Israel. But like birth pains, these famines would grow worse in the land. In 66 AD, Jewish rebels called zealots rose up against their Roman occupiers and began what is now known as the First Jewish Revolt. In response to this, Rome sends 60,000 troops to quash this rebellion, and they move from the northern parts of Israel down through towns and villages, burning towns, burning villages, burning crops, torching everything, in many ways like fire being sent from heaven. Jerusalem itself would be cast into a series of darkness and plagues in which there would be civil war. And one group of zealots during this civil war of this period would burn the entire store of food inside the city of Jerusalem just before the Romans siege the city. Tens of thousands of people would die from starvation in Jerusalem because of this famine. The first trumpet predicts that these things are about to take place. The second trumpet then sounds immediately upon the heels of this first trumpet. And when he hears the second trumpet sound, a burning mountain is cast into the sea and the sea turns to blood. Again, this trumpet plague echoes the first plague in Egypt where the Nile was turned to blood. But it also uses language from the Jewish prophet Jeremiah, who describes not Egypt, but the city of Babylon as a burning mountain that is going to be destroyed, buried beneath the waters. In other words, a sort of hybrid Egypt-Babylon is going to be destroyed, and this destruction is going to look like a burning mountain cast into the heart of a bloody sea. Jesus would predict that this is exactly what would happen to the city of Jerusalem. Immediately after his confrontation with the leaders of the city who had turned the temple into what he calls a den of thieves, he says this to his disciples. Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, 
If you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. This passage in its context is not about juicing up our faith so that we can, quote, move mountains, but is about the destruction of the temple which sat on the mountaintop, the mountain that Jesus points to and identifies as this mountain that will be cast into the sea. This passage begins Jesus' week-long confrontation with the religious leaders in Jerusalem leading up to his crucifixion. And during this week of confrontation, Jesus continues to repeat to the religious leaders that Jerusalem and its temple are going to fall. And no one believed him. Thirty years now after Jesus' prophetic prediction of Jerusalem's fall, John sees that same mountain now hurtling in the air toward the sea and turning it into blood. Not long after this vision, Rome would lay siege to Jerusalem for five months. And on August 4th of 70 AD, the emperor's son, the Roman emperor's son Titus, would break through the Jewish defenses and raid the city of Jerusalem literally throwing the stones of the Temple Mount on top of each other, turning every single stone over and burning the temple to the ground. I want you to listen for a moment to the ancient historian Josephus describe this event as he stood on the hillside opposite watching it take place. He says this, The hill on which the temple stood was seething hot, and seemed enveloped to its base in one sheet of flame. And the blood was in larger quantity than the fire. And those who were slain more in number than those that slew them. The ground was nowhere visible. All was covered in corpses. A burning mountain and a sea of blood indeed. John then goes on to hear the third trumpet sound, and he sees what he says, a great star fall from heaven blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and the springs of water. He calls this star Wormwood, and it turns waters into bitter and poisonous liquid, killing many people. This is also connected to the first plague in Egypt in which not only was the water of the Nile turned to blood, but it was also poisoned. This poisoned water is poisoned by a falling star he calls Wormwood. This has echoes of the prophet Isaiah who saw the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14 falling like a star. He says, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, O son of the dawn. Day star is where we get our English word Lucifer. And Isaiah's prophecy points to satanic power that stands behind the king of Babylon. The prophet, the prophet Jeremiah also spoke of false prophets who would poison the water with their false teachings, spreading ungodliness throughout the entire land. Jesus, again, warned of Jerusalem's false prophets spreading their deadly poison. He would say, during his last week, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and per- perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Jesus would rebuke these false teachers, saying that just like the great liar stood, the great liar Satan stood behind the king of Babylon, so now he also stands behind the religious leaders of Israel. He says this to them in John chapter 8, You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus would also warn the churches in Revelation about this, quote, synagogue of Satan, false prophets who are spreading poisonous teachings throughout the entire Mediterranean world. The trumpet that warned that these poisonous and bitter teachings would lead to the death of many. And so it did. The religious and military leaders of Israel during the first Jewish revolt 
some of whom claimed to be the long-awaited Messiah of Israel, arose, and it led Israel to a bloody and catastrophic end. The civil war that arose between the religious leaders on the one hand who were corrupted due to their compromise with Rome and the military military leaders on the other hand who were corrupted due to their lust for power contributed to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Jewish people. Finally, and most devastatingly, their false and satanic counsel that Rome would be defeated by a grand and miraculous intervention from God proved to be false and led to the deaths, according to most historians, of upwards of a million Jews, a sort of holocaust of the first century. John then hears the fourth trumpet sound. This time, celestial bodies are struck with darkness. Once again, this plague echoes the plague of darkness that struck Egypt some 1,300 years earlier. Additionally, the darkening of the sun, moon, and stars is a common prophetic device used in the Old Testament to describe the consequences of Israel breaking covenant with God. The stars were markers of days and times and seasons. They gave a sense of order to both day and night. And in this way, Genesis describes them as rulers of the day and night. The sun, moon, and stars became symbols for Israel's leaders who were supposed to represent and sustain God's order and harmony. Just as the sun rose each day and the moon followed a regular cycle and the stars moved consistently across the sky, so too were Israel's leaders to bring stability and security to the land. But in breaking covenant with God, they plunged Israel into darkness, chaos, and destruction. Jesus spoke against such leadership, famously pronouncing in Matthew chapter 23 his woes upon the scribes and Pharisees. Not only this, but Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem would come at the hand of these kinds of leaders and would use this similar language to describe the chaos Israel's leadership would bring. He says this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the heavens, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. As we've already seen during the first Jewish revolt, this is precisely what occurred. Israel was not only plunged into a great conflict with its Roman oppressors, but would collapse into civil war. Infighting and assassinations would plague Israel's leaders who would plunge Jerusalem into chaos and darkness, dividing the city ultimately into three separate sections and lead to some of the most barbaric and inhumane acts one could imagine. Because Israel had rejected Jesus as the true morning star, their lesser lights would betray them and plunge them into chaos and the deepest of darkness. What we begin to see from this text is that Revelation is not ultimately about the end of our world, but was about the end of Israel's world. It isn't about our end times, but about the end times for Jerusalem. As Jesus would say to his accusers, the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world to today may be charged against this generation. It was the end of their age, the end of all that Israel knew. Their temple would be destroyed, never to be rebuilt, their faith a shell of what it once was. Imagine just for a moment if your family had worshipped in this building for a thousand years and it was suddenly burned to the ground and you were never allowed to return. How would that reshape your world? This was Israel's experience. So if this is true, if Revelation is about the end of Israel's world, what does this mean for us? What does this imply when we turn the map around? What Revelation begins to unfold for us is that it is the end of the age for Israel, but the beginning of a new age for us. 
As Israel's temple is destroyed and the city of Jerusalem crumbles, God begins to erect a new temple and build a new Jerusalem. In the place of the old temple and the earthly city of Jerusalem, God begins to construct a whole new world. We do not live in the end of an age, but in the beginning of a new one. God's new temple is not being built with limestone, but with living stones. The new Jerusalem unites the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, a new city not of Jews alone, but filled with people of every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages on the face of the earth. This new city cannot be found on any mountain on earth, but is now hidden with Christ in God. And once completed, once the city is finished being built, once the temple is done, being constructed, it will come down out of heaven and make all things new. We live in the beginning of God's great and final age, and we are a part of building his lasting and eternal city. As the gospel continues to spread to every dark corner on the face of the earth, we get to watch as Jesus fulfills his promise to build his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We get to watch as Jesus stacks each of us like living stones one on another so that when finished, we become a dwelling place of God by the Spirit. We together ride in conquest across the face of the earth, conquering the world through suffering love, proclaiming that death has been defeated through the suffering love of Jesus Christ. We together share in the sufferings of Jesus and demonstrate our fitness to rule with him because we have not loved our lives unto death. We are a people who no longer look for how the world will end, but proclaim how the world is being made new through faith in Jesus Christ. We are a people who no longer need to decode the end times because we have come to live now, not in the end of the age, but in the beginning of the age of ages. Indeed, Jesus tells us in John 11 that those who believe in me will never die. We have begun to live the life of the eternal age, a life that cannot be ended by death. One day this new temple that is being constructed will be finished. One day this city that God is building will be completed. And then will come to pass the saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Let's pray. So Father, as we consider these matters together, as some of us even now look at the circumstances of our world and we begin to wonder, is is this the end? It's my prayer, Lord, that you would open the eyes of our hearts to see that we are nowhere near the end. But we are just at the beginning of the great and marvelous work that you are doing. We are just at the beginning of the eternal age. I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to see the marvelous work that you are doing as you build your new Jerusalem as you invite citizens from tribes and tongues and nations all across the face of the earth into this new and heavenly city, as you build a new temple with every single person that becomes a part of this family of God. Father, I pray that we would see this as your great work of new creation so that we would not live as people in fear about when the end might come, but that we would live as people who have hope. We would live as people who see what you are doing. We would live as people who stand fearlessly in our world proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. 
Father, I pray that you would work within us these truths and help us to see. Father, it's my prayer today that those who may be tuning in and watching from a distance, who may be strangers to this church family, who may be strangers to your family, I pray that they would hear the good news of Jesus. That not only is he making a new creation, but he's welcoming in everyone, no matter what they've done, no matter what sins they've committed, no matter how they've failed, that you are calling them in through the power of your Holy Spirit to be a part of your eternal family, to be a part of the thing that will never end. I pray that they would turn their eyes to you in faith. Father, I pray that you would bless us as we continue to seek and be faithful to you in this time of pandemic and that we would continue to proclaim your word faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, church family, good to be with you again this Sunday. Glad you've joined us through our online services and grateful for the worship team uh, today leading us in worship. Scott and John joining together in that. And grateful for Sam and uh, opening the word of the Lord to us today and proclaiming God's word in and through the book of Revelation. As we close, just a reminder, if you uh, desire to give at this time, um, to the work and ministry being done here at the church and supporting what God is doing in and through Mission Hills. You can do so very simply by going on the church website, missionhillschurch.org, and clicking the Give tab at the top right-hand corner, and you can set up online payment right there. With that, let me close with a ascending blessing here from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 4. A reminder of the hope that lies before us. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So church family, bless you. May the Lord keep you, and may you hold on to this hope, the truth that he will wipe away every tear, that death shall be no more.